Banks Murders, adapted from his book by Keith Wilkinson, read by Mark Clift. The murder of Melvina Annie Cooley. James Cooley was a tailor, although in 1859 illness had prevented him from working for some time. Since separating from his wife, he had lived mainly with his father in Onken. He had one child, a girl named Melvina, aged two, who lived with him. At 10pm one night in June of that year, he took his young daughter to the house of Jane and John Creer in Douglas and asked Jane if she would look after Melvina for him, promising to pay her two shillings and ninepence a week. Over the next three months, he saw very little of his daughter, and soon fell behind with his payments. In September, he found that he was unable to pay them any longer, and told the Creers he intended to let her stay with relatives in the north of the island. On the night of Tuesday, the 27th of September, at around 8pm, he called at the Creers' house to collect his daughter and carried her away. Later that same week, he returned for her clothes and other belongings, telling Jane that his daughter was well, but he did appear to her to be rather agitated. In 1859, Howstrake Farm in Onken had its own corn mill powered by water from a dam known as the Mill Dam, close to St Peter's Church in the Vicarage Garden. On Sunday, the 9th of October, Robert Killip, aged 13, was playing near the dam when he found the body of a young girl in the water. He summoned help and the coroner had the body removed to the stable of a nearby public house. An inquest was held on Wednesday the 12th of October. The jury viewed the body where it still lay in the stable, and saw that it was in an advanced state of decomposition, with a blunt wound on the left side of the head. Jane Creer gave evidence. She told the inquiry that she had never seen the child's mother, and she had heard that she did not live on the island. She believed that James Cooley had been planning to leave the island shortly after taking Melvina away from her house. John Cooley, James's father, explained that his son had been separated from his wife for about two years. He had not heard from his son since he left, but added that James had mentioned a few weeks earlier that he planned to go to sea. He also said that sometimes he felt his son was not right in his mind. Dr Ring explained that he had made a post-mortem examination of the child's body. He described finding a depressed skull fracture which he felt was sufficient to have caused death. He estimated the body had been in the water around 10 to 14 days and felt the child must have died within three hours of eating her last meal. He felt she was probably still alive when her body was immersed in the water. Mrs Creer was recalled and confirmed that the last meal the child had before her father collected her was identical to that found by the doctor during the post-mortem. Some sop composed of bread, milk and some tea. The jury then visited the spot where the body had been found. They thought it most improbable that a young child could have made her own way there. After ten minutes of deliberation, they gave their verdict. Willful murder against James Cooley. But despite this, there seems to have been no attempt to apprehend James Cooley. According to the Mona's Herald in October 1859, this was because of a lack of funds. The newspaper warned that this situation could lead to the island's laws being stigmatised for failing to even try and catch a convicted child killer. In a letter to the editor three weeks later, and signed by the father of a family, the author stated, If there has ever been perpetrated a murder more atrociously cruel and hellish than any other, that of the poor innocent child by her fiendish father is unquestionably of that foul character. And if there ever was an occasion upon which the astonishment and indignation of a civilised community should be more vehemently aroused and expressed than another, it is when they are given to understand that no efficient effort has been made to arrest the wretch by whose hand the poor innocent evidently was butchered. Why, 
a dozen telegraphic words of this fearful tragedy, borne to the ear of Her Majesty, would result in the publication of such a hue and cry throughout and beyond Europe as would place the miscreant in the hands of justice in a very short time. Nevertheless, the whereabouts of James Cooley were never discovered. He certainly never stood trial for the murder of his young daughter. Mm -hmm.